Aloha, everybody, and welcome to Ehana Kako. We're a weekly program on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kili'i Akina, president of the Grassroot Institute. When we think about the future of Hawaii, the most precious thing, the most valuable thing we can be possibly focusing on is our keiki, our young people. And if Hawaii is going to be a world-class leader in all fields, we're going to have to produce world-class thinkers and doers. And today, I'm with one, a young man who is already a scientist, although he's a sophomore at Iolani High School. Uh, Christopher Lindsay has been attending science fairs ever since they allowed him into one uh, in his sixth grade, and he has been winning awards right and left. He's actually done real science out in the depths of the ocean with the University of Hawaii scientists, as well as out in the depths of space, and he's discovered his own planet. Now, that's just for starters. This sophomore represents a generation of up-and-coming leaders who are going to take Hawaii to a new level, if, of course, we can build a robust economy that allows them to buy homes here in Hawaii and gives them jobs that pays them the kinds of salaries that they deserve. Will you join me in doing that? That's what we believe in, in Think Tech Hawaii and at the Grassroot Institute. But without further ado, I think you're just going to enjoy getting to know this young man and seeing what the future for Hawaii is as we nurture young scientists and other leaders. Welcome to the program, Christopher. Aloha. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Well, I'm a big fan of yours. I, mean, uh, I, I heard you speaking up on a big panel with uh, people who were probably three to four times your own yeah, age. Was... And you, you did very well. Congratulations. Oh, thank you. Now, tell me a little bit about your first foray into science, your first science fair. All right. So uh, my dad was a scientist. He's a physicist. All right. Um, and I wanted to do science fairs ever since I was, ever since I could talk. I wanted to do science. That's all I wanted to do. And... I wanted to join science fair ever since I was little as well. Well, what was science to you back then? I, I remember for my children, who are more into the arts and law and so forth today, <laughs> they're much older than you, um, yeah. the, the, their idea of science was Barney made the rainbow. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for you, what was your idea of science? Well, I was always fascinated with nature. I loved watching butterflies hatch from chrysalises. And I loved science at school, too. And I just wanted to... I have my own research project and research an area of science that I was interested in. Were you uh, intensely curious about the world and how it works? Yeah, I'd say that. Yeah. Really, you were. <laughs> well, well that's fascinating. To, I would always ask questions that would go on forever, asking why this, why that. Well, for you, going to a science fair was very important. And I remember in our earlier conversation, you said that you weren't allowed to go because you weren't <laughs> old enough when you were th in yeah. third grade or fourth grade or fifth grade. What was the attraction? for you to science fairs. Yeah, so science fairs started in sixth grade for me, um, so that's when I started. But the, what really attracted me to science fair was the fact that I didn't know exactly what to expect when I did a research project. So when I uh, was in class, usually the labs and things that the teacher had us do, um, they were fascinating and they really piqued my interest in science. Um, but I always, if I had a basic interest in science or um, knowledge of science, I knew what was going to happen. Um, before I even completed the lab. Now, but, for some of our audience, uh, there may not be much familiarity with what a science fair is. Yeah. But, but a science fair is not just a, an opportunity to come and display something. It's actually the doing of real science, yeah. isn't it? Do you want to explain a bit uh, yeah, about so the process? Definitely having the actual fair and being judged is a big part of science fair. Um, but what the real joy for me in science fair comes from actually doing a research project finding an area of science that you're interested in, that you want to study and want to learn more about, and actually finding a question you want answered and devising a way to answer that question. So what was your project in sixth grade, your very first science yep. fair project? My uh, first project in sixth grade was called Freezer Fry uh, Atmospheric Radio Occult, which involved atmospheric radio occultations, which sounds kind of strange, but a radio occultation is um, happens when GPS satellites communicate with low Earth orbiting satellites, and the radio signals pass through the atmosphere. And so something happens because yeah. these are real things, aren't yeah. they? They're not just uh, vapor. Yeah. So I studied uh, radio signals passing uh -huh. through the atmosphere. And so what did you learn? And I learned uh, my first year of doing that project, I learned that the temperature at a given altitude above the land did not depend on whether the land was ocean or mountains, as long as it was at the same latitude. Is it, that right? It uh, didn't matter whether mountains or ocean was. Now, did the world know that before your experiment? I don't think they did. I think so. You actually that, had a scientific breakthrough. Um, 
Yeah, in sixth grade. <laughs> How maybe. about that? <laughs> what, what's the practical result uh, of knowing that? Well, I don't really know any practical results of okay. having that, uh, knowing the temperature is the same whether you're above mountains or above sea. But I guess you could use it in maybe aviation. Or Perhaps. Like that. Is it necessary to know the practical result, or is science worth doing in and of itself? I, th I think that science is worth doing in and of, in of, of itself, but um, to get funding, oh, of <laughs> you course. need a practical well, result. But, you know, the, the University of Chicago motto on the Britannica says, let knowledge grow from more to more. Do, do you have a faith that as scientific knowledge grows, the results will be seen, the practical oh, yes. implications? Um, Obviously, the more the human race, the more everyone knows, um, our society will progress exponentially. Well, would you do something for us that's going to be educational for me and for my uh, audience here, that, which is across the world? Define for us what science is. How would Ooh. you do that? Just to your friends, if you're just I think sitting down with them. I think it's simply the study of nature. OK, just study of nature. What happens, what physical things happen in nature, and what patterns you can see that happen in nature. So that would be the subject matter, the physical world, yeah. nature in and of itself. Yeah. Does science also have a certain way in which we study, a certain methodology? I think uh, to do science, you need to have an interest in a topic that you're doing, and then you need to find a question that you want answered about that topic. Oh, the question. Yeah. The so for me, hypothesis. for me, I wanted to know if temperature depended on the topography of the land beneath All right. it. And so I used um, a method uh, with GPS radio occultation, these GPS satellites and radio signals, uh, to determine um, the answer to my question. So science would be framing good questions yeah. that will allow you to do research concerning the physical world. Yep. That's what it. are some of those questions that are driving your research now, or have done so since sixth grade? Well, which really isn't a long time <laughs> for you. <laughs> Well, ever since I was little, I was super interested in space. When I was in third grade, I spent uh, three years saving six hundred dollars to buy a telescope. How about that? So I can, uh, so I can look at the moon and. Now, was that retail, for, or did you yeah, actually get it at a retail? Right. <laughs> OrionTelescopes.com. All and right. So I wanted to learn more about space, and the big question that I, I'm still wondering about now, and scientists all over the world are wondering about now, is: Are we alone in the universe? Is fascinating. Huge question. question. Do you have uh, heroes such as Carl Sagan who, oh, yeah. who wrestled with that very question? Yep. What do you know about Sagan? I know he produced uh, that TV show. Cosmos. <laughs> Cosmos. That classic show. And, yep. You know, sequels yeah, are never as good that. as the original. There is oh, yeah. a sequel that, that is out, the but, but there will never yep. be another Carl Sagan nope. telling us that the universe is billions yeah. and billions, billions and billions. <laughs> yep. Well, how about that? And so, well, what uh, is it about the search for extraterrestrial life that, that compels you? Well, why are you curious about that subject? Isn't there enough life here in Honolulu? Well, I think it's both an interesting subject from just a human curiosity point of view, but also in the practical sense, if there was something out there, we'd want to know about it. And also if the human race declines for some reason, if climate change gets out of uh -huh. control, if we don't um, take care of our environment, we might have to go to another world. And if we can find another world that's suitable for life, um, looking for extraterrestrials would probably be the best way. Would it be? Or would that depend upon whether they were friendly to us? I yeah, there's a, <laughs> yeah, there's a Stephen Hawking quote that says that he doesn't want to find uh, extraterrestrials because if they're, um, if they're advanced enough to find us, then we're in trouble. Well, Carl Sagan coined the phrase SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial yep. Intelligence. Intelligence yeah. And uh, can you tell us how your own research involves some of the SETI mean, means and yep. uh, methodology? Well, my research isn't specifically looking for aliens and like little green men living on some other planet. Uh, my uh, research, green men and or women. Uh, uh, green men and corrected. women. Yep. You're going to get grants for your science. But anyway, green, um, green persons. Green, okay. green people living on other planets. Uh -huh. But rather, I'm looking for the planets themselves. Because we don't know of any life that can live on a star. <laughs> All right. It's way too inhospitable for life to exist. So we have to uh, look for what we're on right now, which is a planet. And we want to find a planet that's similar to ours 
so that we'll be able to um, we'll be able to find a world that's suitable for life. And once we find a world that's suitable for life, uh, we can infer that life can live on that. Now you've actually discovered a planet. Tell us yep. how that came about. All right. So um, there's uh, I had a partnership with a scientist from the European Space Agency, oh. and they have a satellite called the CORO, or the Convection, Rotation, and Planetary Transit Satellite, which it's a space telescope. And what it does is it scans the sky looking for dips in light um, intensity of a star. And when it sees a dip in light intensity, you can infer that that star um, had something pass in between that star and the observer, which is the telescope. And then one in a thousand times, that could be maybe a planet that's crossing in between that star, its parent star, and the observer. And once you find that, you have to uh, study that star for a long time, so you see periods, um, a periodic dip. Mm -hmm. And so you can infer that that planet's rotating around the star, and it wasn't some uh, error in your research. So when you discovered that what you were observing was a planet, uh, what, what happened next? Did, was there a, a news bulletin sent all across the world? Or is this a fairly well, routine kind of finding there's, nowadays? There's um, almost, I think, 3,000 exoplanets mm -hmm. that have been discovered so far, and it's growing every day. Um, well, maybe every other day. We're still not finding them extremely fast, but with telescopes like Kepler and with new telescopes and telescopes on Mauna Kea, we're, found, we're finding more and more exoplanets every day. Where is your planet located? How far it, away from Earth is it? It is um, seven light years away from Earth, and it, the star itself is invisible to the naked eye. So you can't see it just looking outside. But it's in the constellation of Ophiuchus. How about um, that? I don't know if you know the constellation. Which part of the sky is it in uh, during the uh, winter months here in Hawaii? So anybody can kind of go out and point to it tonight. Mm. I'm not. I'm not sure. <laughs> I have an app for that. <laughs> well, very good. Have you seen it at Bishop Museum? Have you seen the, the region of the sky in the planetarium? Oh, I've seen the, the constellation of Ophiuchus. is a really big pentagon. <laughs> so it's pretty um, distinguishable in the night sky. And if you see that in the bottom left-hand corner of that, um, of that constellation is a star that has a tiny little planet revolving around it. There you go. So tell us a little bit about your planet. Is it one of the candidates for potential right, so life? We don't think it's a candidate for potential life for the reason that it's too close to its parent star. Ah. It's actually, if we took our solar system... There's a lesson there, isn't there, yeah. being too close to your parents? <laughs> <laughs> You've got a wonderful mother. I had the, right. have had the opportunity to meet her. But go on. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so if, if the... Um, Pretend our solar system had that planet in it. That planet would actually be inside of the orbit of Mercury, All which right. is closer than our closest system, our closest planet. And so Mercury's temperatures are in excess of um, 200 degrees Celsius. So you can't really live there. Absolutely. Well, now let's go, let's go the other direction, from the extreme heat to the extreme cold. You, in addition to studying the stars and and, oh, and yeah. the planets and the skies at night, you're, you're also studying in the depths of the ocean. You have a research project with yep. scientists at the School of Ocean and Earth Science yep. Technology at the University of Hawaii. Tell us about that. Yeah, so uh, for about two years now, I've been working with uh, my mentor at the SOEST, or School of Ocean and Earth Science Technology. Um, her name is Dr. Margo Edwards, and she's a fantastic mentor. That's been um, allowing me to do time-lapse camera research. Well, that's incredible. Uh, you know, tell us about that when we come back from a short break. Right. I'm Kili'i Aquino with Chris Lindsay, who is a sophomore at Iolani High School, but he is a bona fide scientist. Uh, he's part of the emerging generation of young millennials who are going to take Hawaii to new heights. Uh, don't go away because you'll want to hear the rest of his story and some of his opinions on what teenagers are like. <laughs> we'll be right back after this. Okay, I'm Jay Fidel, that's Ray Starling. We co-host a show called Hawaii, the State of Clean Energy, every Wednesday, 4 to 5 p.m. It's really interesting. You know, Ray has a way of unzipping these guys. He, he asks them these questions, and all this stuff tumbles out, and we find out stuff we would never know about without Ray's question. Thank you, Ray. You're welcome, uh, Jay. I, I'm very pleased to be your um, Ed McMahon <laughs> uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock here uh, on, uh, on the internet. So you can join us and see what's happening in the energy world. And there is a lot going on. 
So join us uh, every Wednesday at 4 o'clock. Yeah, come around. Be energized right here on ThinkTech. Aloha. Welcome back to Ehana Kako on the ThinkTech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Ehana Kako means let's work together. Can you think of the terrible alternative? Let's not work together. <laughs> but there are so many reasons to work together here in the state of Hawaii to build a better economy, government, and society. And I want to take my hat off to the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network and especially to producer Jay Fidel. Uh, this network is doing a wonderful job of producing 25 to 30 hours of original content from Hawaii that is broadcast across the world. And you can look at that at any time at thinktechhawaii.com. Back to my guest, uh, Christopher Lindsay, a mm -hmm. sophomore at Iolani High School. You were yep. telling us about the project you are currently working on with the School of Ocean and Earth Science Technology at the UH. Yep. So this project involves uh, time-lapse cameras and we have determined that time-lapse cameras is one of the best ways to study um, extremely deep uh, animals living in 500 meters or greater depth where light never shines. And so um, we have, uh, there's, a, there's a project called the Hawaii Undersea Military Munitions Assessment, or the HUMA. All right. And this project is focused on, res focused on researching discarded military munitions. So after World War II, we, in Hawaii, we had all these munitions that we didn't need anymore because the war had ended. And so um, what the government decided to do to dispose of all these munitions, because they didn't want to keep it on land and let it into the water table, uh, was dump them offshore into uh, the deep ocean off Pearl Harbor. And did we keep track of where all these were? Or, or do we have No to... one did. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> did. And so, so that's what we're focusing process on now. by which they're discovered. Are you, are you looking yep. for them, actually? We're not looking or for you, the... Um, once you find them, you start to study yeah. them. The assessment does look for these uh, munitions with um, side scanning sonar and things like that from boats and also submarines. But what I'm focused on and what my mentor, Dr. Edwards, is focused on is how these munitions are affecting the environment. Because um, these munitions were filled with stuff like mustard gas uh -huh. and gunpowder. Now, did the environmental impact have anything to do with your interest in the research? Is it because you care about the environment, or was that just one of the byproducts of your well, research? Well, I, I do care about the environment, but I'm also super interested in just seeing what's down there. All because right. There's your scientific curiosity yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah. And so what we're uh, looking for is how these munitions are affecting the environment, um, because we think that maybe um, that the munitions could have released chemicals into small plankton, and those plankton could have been eaten by larger animals and larger animals, and eventually that toxin would get into fish that we eat. So, so what is your, your research problem that you're trying to solve? What are you trying to, to discover with your research? With the uh, munitions assessment, we're trying to discover if the munitions are having an effect on the environment. Okay, and so what have you discovered so far? Um, what the, the whole project is, and the Hummer is way bigger than just me. Okay. I'm just like, really happy to be on their, um, on their team and have cameras on their ship. Um, but what they've all discovered is that uh, right now the, the munitions are no longer posing threats to the environment immediately, but rather these munitions are actually providing new habitats for animals living well, in the deep ocean. that's very fascinating, isn't yep. that? Now, let me ask you this question. How, how many uh, of the students at Iolani are interested in science in the way you are? Well, uh, if our participation in science fair is any, uh, is any indicator, I was, I was the only one last year and the only one this year. Now, that kind so, of surprises me, Christopher, yeah. and I'll tell you why. Because Iolani attracts some of the brightest students oh, yeah. in the entire state. And certainly, uh, they are the most expensive. <laughs> $20,000 <000 laughs> a year. There yeah. you go, or amongst the most expensive. And, and you are a, a relative minority in terms of students who are actively involved in scientific research? Definitely. Well, well, why is that the case? Well, I think that Iolani does place a big interest and mm -hmm. an importance on science. We take biology, chemistry, and physics. Those are core classes that you have to take. Sure. And they're advanced classes. They're not easy pass um, classes. Like I'm. I'm, even I'm having a hard time in uh, chemistry honors in 10th grade. But for most students, class, but is that really a, a, a commitment to doing science, or is that more of a college prep to get that on their resume? That's more of a college prep, I'd say, um, because a lot of students aren't really um, interested mm -hmm. in answering their own questions about the, about the uh, 
about the nature around them. They rather answer questions on a test and then get a good get a good grade. Do you think that the l relatively low interest in extracurricular science at Iolani is characteristic of your school, or some, it says something about this generation of young people in Hawaii overall? Well, I think that in Iolani especially, there's lots of other work that <laughs> that you okay. have to do that um, is part of your schoolwork, and that's challenging. Homework is tough, and it takes hours every night. So it may not necessarily homework. be a lack of interest yeah. in science, but rather the, the cost of taking the time to do scientific yeah. research is so high when compared to the other work you have to do yeah. that a lot of students don't do it. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. But overall, I know you have some th thoughts as to how well we're doing as a state in terms of preparing young people uh, to go into careers in science or even to be scientifically interested. How do you think that's going in the school system overall? Well, in the, in the public schools right now, especially in the elementary schools, um, I notice because I have uh, cousins, relatives, and family friends that are in um, public elementary schools right now that they don't have any science in their curriculum, uh, curriculum in the public elementary schools. And I was really surprised about that. Now, now let me probe that a little bit. What do you mean they don't have any science? So they have. Do they at least have a textbook that, that uh, teaches something about science? Do they go through a course at some point in they learn elementary like school? Math and how to read. Is that right? And they just. Uh, do they have the miniature schools. laboratories and so forth where teachers show them how to do experiments? Unfortunately, not. <laughs> so they don't cut open frogs? Nope. <laughs> no. <laughs> really? Unfortunately, yeah. So, um, I was, what do you think about that? Yeah, I was, I was surprised and shocked because one of the reasons why I got so interested in science is because I, I had an awesome uh, elementary school science teacher. I still remember her. Her name was Mrs. White. And she, um, she was hard on my handwriting, uh, but she was a great teacher in terms of getting me to uh, have an interest in science. And we did the butterflies. We hatched butterflies. We dissected frogs. We, did, we built... Um, little paper roller coasters and all sorts of things in science and engineering How about that, that they now, don't get in a public school. In your right own now. life, if you had not been exposed to science methodology at an early age, if you had not seen experiments being done, if you didn't have the opportunity to play with test tubes and Bunsen burners and other things like that, w would that have impacted your, your interest in pursuing science at the level you are now? I think it would have had an impact. I think I still would have been interested in science because I just had a mm -hmm. fascination with nature. But um, for a lot of kids, I think that having science at an early age would really get them um, to have an interest in science at an older age. Well, when I meet people today who are highly accomplished in certain fields, such as violin playing or ballet, yeah. uh, musical instrument, or, or actually being an artist and so forth, it, almost invariably they began when they were young. And you don't have people becoming ballet yeah. dancers who, at the age of 22, decide, I want to start I taking ballet. Yeah, yeah. Same thing with uh, athletes and so forth. Do you think that is true of science? Yeah, I think that science takes time to nurture a, a good scientist. And they need to have an interest and continue that interest for a long time. And I think that um, you acquire skills along the way when you're um, doing simple science projects and that you can use those simple skills uh, to do harder and harder and more advanced research mm -hmm. until you're a professional researcher doing groundbreaking medical research or finding uh, life in other planets. Well, you mentioned Carl Sagan a little bit earlier when we were talking about the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But Sagan was also passionate about being an educator. In fact, yeah. as his career went on, he did less and less of actual uh, uh, empirical science and more and more of education. That seemed to be his great passion. Did you, do you feel that you are also an educator yeah, or I want to be an educator? One of my goals when I learned that public schools didn't have any science was to, um, was to teach public school students science. And I started a um, uh, kind of community service project in our grade. And I'm the class president for the sophomore class, so I've That's had right, some another one of your many accomplishments. <laughs> you were also the influence. freshman class president, Yeah, I was you? the freshman and the sophomore. I started this in freshman year. Well, you've got this locked in if you want yeah. to be the junior <laughs> president. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> um, so I started a community service project that we took 10 or so uh, older kids, 9th or 10th grade, and we took them to a school called Ali'i Olani Elementary yes. School. 
and we had a program called STEM Buddies, and STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. That's, and that's right. That's a big thing we're trying to push here in Hawaii. And we um, decided that each, each month we'll go on the first Tuesday um, to this elementary school and to teach them a lesson about science. And it can be anything. We've had uh, lessons where we uh, learned about sharks and dug through sand for shark teeth. And we've had lessons where we've planted plants. We've had seeds that came from space. Oh. That they took seeds and then they took them in, up in the space shuttle and brought them back down. Now, does Ali'i Olani School have a science program, per se? Or um, is it one of those schools that yeah, it, they don't doesn't have, have one? An in curriculum science program, but they do have this, um, uh, like a STEM, they okay. have a STEM to classroom mm -hmm. um, to supplement it, but the students have to, like, volunteer to go in this classroom. Not in other words, uh, spend more voluntary. time at school. Yeah. Where so it's not they really the want to go and play, which is so, good too. So you're exposing science to a lot of kids who otherwise wouldn't get that exposure. I think so, yeah. Well, that's really something. It's commendable. Now, are you, do you have other friends who are involved in the Yeah, like process? I bring, um, there's a bunch of regular people, and there's more and more people that want to go and uh, teach these kids science because they realize that, um, that we're so lucky to be at Iolani and have science um, at an early age, but these kids um, aren't so lucky. They can't go to uh, private school for financial, uh, financial reasons mostly, and so that we should definitely help them. What do you think here in our state of Hawaii, and I'm talking more along the lines of public policy now, <laughs> that, that, that we should be doing to encourage young people at, at an earlier age to consider science and to, to be comfortable with science, even if they're not going to be scientists, and for those who will be scientists, get an early start. What do you think we yeah. could do? If, if, let's say if you were governor <laughs> of the state of Hawaii, mm. you know, if you keep going in terms of your student body president's, uh, <laughs> presidency, you, you might get be up governor all the way someday. Up there. But if you were governor, what would you do? Well, I definitely want science in public schools. Like, that would be the one thing that I'm trying to do now and that I'd try to do if I was governor. <laughs> um, but I know that money is tight and, but, and it's hard to get science in public schools, but you don't need a lot um, to, to teach science to young people. Like our STEM Buddies uh, community service project had $1,000 this year um, that we're using to buy soil, like uh -huh. we're buying dirt and we're buying <laughs> seeds and um, things to teach these kids science and that doesn't cost a lot of money. So getting people involved at the community level, at the yeah. grassroots level so to speak, yeah. is, is something that can save a lot of money and so that it doesn't have to be a very expensive government program to teach basic science. Yep. Well, well that sounds like a very good idea. And you're, you're right, money is tight in our state, but I have a sneaking suspicion, tell me what you think, <laughs> that if we taught science early and often to young people, ultimately we'd have more money in our state. Yeah, I think that scientific literacy is very important for uh, growing a strong economy. And uh, people that have scientific knowledge that um, know more uh, will have better jobs. And, will, uh, and if we have great inventors and, um, and engineers, we'll have um, better possibilities for Absolutely. higher paying jobs. Yeah. You, you mentioned scientific literacy, and you're talking about how well informed the general yep. public is about science issues. I'm sh certain you've seen on the news, and maybe you've tracked them, are, are dealing with issues such as genetically modified organisms on, yep. on Kauai and on the Big Island and so forth. How, how well informed do you think we as uh, a people in Hawaii are when it comes to science and scientific d related decisions for public policy? Yeah, I think like, our entire country needs to okay, really that's... step up our game in the scientific literacy. You're a good uh, politician. You see, great. you take the pressure off of saying anything about Hawaii and yep. say, it's the whole country. <laughs> <laughs> so you, you think that, that we, we've got some ground yep. to cover here. Yeah, definitely. And, and does it all go back to early science education? I think that a lot of it does. Um, but obviously, we need to continue science education in high school as well and support programs like the Science Fair, which gets um, uh, some of the brightest kids uh, to do um, science research of their own. And that really inspire them to become scientists, engineers, um, 
scientific, scientifically literate people in the future. What's the project you, you're working on now for the next science fair? So um, You've got probably a couple more science fairs left in your yeah, high school I, career. Yeah, hopefully three. <laughs> okay. Yep. Um, but that project is the uh, underwater deep sea um, project uh, that I'm working on right now, studying the, I'm uh, studying the deep ocean and the animals that live in it. Well, that sounds fascinating. When we come back from a break, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit and ask you to, to pontificate as a spokesperson for the millennial generation. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I'm with Chris Lindsay, who's a sophomore at Iolani School, a fascinating man who has accomplished much in terms of science already and indeed is a scientist. Uh, I, I look at him and see somebody who is... Uh, an emerging leader for Hawaii, and we need so many more like him. This is Keili'i Aquino with Think Tech Hawaii's Ehana Kako. We'll be right back after this quick message. Don't go away. Aloha. I'm Hunter Hevelin, host of Sustainable Hawaii here at Think Tech Hawaii. You can tune in every week on Thursday at 2 p.m. to see interviews with sustainability professionals from around the state and even further abroad, learning about activities with water management, food security, waste management, and a whole host of other uh, fascinating opportunities to get engaged with making a greener island. So if you're interested in making the transition from consuming individuals to communities of producers, check us out every Thursday. Aloha and welcome back to Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. I'm Kaylee Akina, president of Grassroot Institute, and my guest today is Chris Lindsay, sophomore at Iolani School. Uh, I hope you understand how important it is for us to, to get into the minds of young men and women like Christopher. Uh, he's representing something that, that we need more and more of nowadays, and that is young people who are devoted to learning a craft, a trade, a, a, a field, a discipline, and, and taking that to, to the next level so that not only do they advance, but Hawaii, our society, our economy, go to higher levels. Christopher, we, we were talking about what you're doing, and in some ways it's quite remarkable because most students aren't engaged in science at the level you are. But in other ways, do you think that you're like most millennials, young people between 15 and 25, or, or, or different? How would you characterize yourself? Well, I'm, I think I'm mostly similar to them. I just have a, a keen interest in science, and that's almost my only difference. Like I, I like the same things they do. I talk the same way. I'm the same age. Well, what are the millennials like here in the <laughs> for, for those of us who are several decades removed, I remember back in my day, I wanted to be groovy. I liked the Beatles and <laughs> so forth. But uh, what, what, is, what typically defines, well, particularly, the Hawaii millennial? We're, this, we're the same way as you guys were when you guys were young. We, we want to be cool, and we like Bruno Mars or whichever. So there are trends, and, and there is peer pressure, and, and, and there is style that, that's unique. I, yeah. <laughs> How about thinking about um, the future in terms of uh, being serious or, or just being carefree about it? What, what are most of your generation like? Well, at Iolani, I meet a lot of people that are um, really driven and motivated to uh, do important things with their life. I met, uh, lives. I've met a lot of people that want to become doctors when they grow up and they study really hard in school so they can go to med school. I met uh, some people that want to be politicians when they grow up so they can change the world. But I've also met a lot of people that um, don't really have that same motivation as uh, these other people do. And they kind of just want to go through school and pass all their classes and play video games when they go home or go well, beach. A recent study just came out that said the millennials are less concerned than previous generations about their own financial well-being. They're, they're concerned to make sure they have an adequate amount, but they're more concerned about doing something meaningful in life, something that actually affects society. How would you evaluate that statement? Yeah, I've actually, I have noticed that, actually. Um, when I meet someone that's really driven, that wants to do something with their lives, uh, they mainly want to do something for the sake of helping people or for the sake of changing the world, not so much for the sake of making a lot of money. Like, I've, um, there's still people that I want to get rich. That's what I want to do in my life. Um, but there's, um, I say there's more people that just want to do something good. 
Well, you know, you mentioned that you started a non, uh, you started a community organization to help children learn science. Uh, I don't remember when I was growing up uh, other teenagers starting organizations and, and do, doing community service at that level. That we all we we tended to be involved in. Uh, something that was already established, go to the hospital and volunteer and so forth. And I, do, do you sense that there is more entrepreneurship in starting up what, uh, avenues for helping the, the poor or helping children or, or carrying out community service today? I think that that happens sometimes. Um, but obviously, we still have um, our community service in our, our class. Um, it still involves mostly uh, beach cleanups mm -hmm. or painting bus stops for the bus company or things like that. Um, but there are a lot of people that want to, um, they see a problem and they see that no one's trying to fix it. And um, they decide to do something about it. What do your fellow students at Iolani think about the public schools? The public school as an institution and, and the people of the public school? I think that most people at Iolani... By the way, I'm giving you an out here. I'm not asking what you think. Okay. <laughs> they think... I'm asking. Those other people think that, um, <laughs> that uh, Elon... That's in well, case you run for office someday, by yeah. the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we're, we're happy to be on the Yelani. We're extremely thankful, um, most of us are extremely thankful to um, have the education that we have and that we're able to have such good teachers, such qualified teachers. Um, and I think a lot of people feel sorry for the public schools because uh, we see in the news always that public schools got their funding cut again. And so they won't have class on Fridays now, or something like that. And we see the initial reaction for a lot of people is, oh, I don't want to go to school on Friday. But I think a, a lot of people um, realize later that I need class. I need class to um, do better with my life. I need class to uh, get into a better college and to have a better job later. So I think we're, we're thankful to be at Iolani. Where do you and your friends plan to spend your, your years after college, building your career? After college, well, I have a lot of friends that want to be doctors. <laughs> and, but I also have uh, some friends that want to be scientists. Um, I don't know why they're not doing science fair. <laughs> Maybe it's a time constraint. But I know, some, uh, I know some people that are really interested in science, and they love science as, a, as an idea. Um, they just don't have time to really pursue it. Mm -hmm. um, Do you ever think the about the future and the economy of Hawaii or whether Hawaii will have the opportunities for, for, for you to advance uh, and so forth? Well, I don't really think about it. Like every night I go to uh -huh. sleep and think about it. But I think that Hawaii is, I think Hawaii is in a great position um, to be a premier scientific uh, state. Because oh, we have, say that again, would you? Hawaii? We are in a premier position to be a amazing scientific state. Oh, I love that. I'm going to vote for you for governor. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and and why have, do you say that? We have natural resources here that you can't find anywhere else. Okay, we have, so we have the subject for the study of science. People actually come from across the planet and maybe from other planets yeah. <laughs> in, in, in order to study our ecosystem here. Yeah, we have a unique ecosystem that we don't see anywhere else. We have my, my two projects, the deep ocean and astronomy, are both possible because I live we, on I live That's in right. Hawaii. We have the ocean and yep. the sky. Yep. Um, we have two of the uh, most uh, well-known astronomy uh, observatories. Uh, we have Haleakala and Mauna Kea, which are both doing incredible research every night that it's not raining. Um, we also have amazing groups doing, uh, especially at the UH, doing research on ocean, uh, oceanography and study of the ocean. And we also have groups on, at NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, and um, with the UH, uh, doing studies on the atmosphere. If you've ever seen that graph of CO2, uh, CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, they have parts per million and then time, and you see it going like this. That was done on Mauna Loa. And I've been to that, uh, that site, and I was blown away by the incredible science that is possible uh, mm. to do in Hawaii, because we live in Hawaii. You know, when I listen to you, I, I'm inspired by being reminded of the tremendous opportunities that we have here in Hawaii. 
just incredible opportunities. And just to hear you mention them and to sense your excitement about these opportunities for the study of science, I know there are opportunities for so much more. But, but I, I don't know how well you track this in our economy and in our political sphere. We're not yet realizing those opportun fulfilling those opportunities here. Um, we, you were on a panel recently, and some of the the uh, other members of that panel who are all uh, adults in the community involved in politics and government and the University of Hawaii basically agreed that despite these opportunities we have, we're not working together in, in such a way to really seize the moment, uh, bringing together the governmental resources, building the economic engine, and, and all of that. And so Hawaii really is experiencing what we call the brain drain. Uh, and yeah. I, I appreciate your, your uh, recognition of the opportunities, but, but increasingly we are seeing young men and women with your talent and your intelligence not only go off to get your graduate degrees, but to stay away from Hawaii for most of your career. Not that that's bad for an individual, but uh, did, what do you think Hawaii can do ultimately yeah. to draw back people away from the brain drain? Well, I have an example, actually. Uh, my sister, who is older than me, she's 23 now, um, she went to Princeton after graduating from Iolani and spent four years there and got a uh, bachelor's in um, microbiology. And then she had a choice. She could get her doctorate at the UH, at SOAS, and research microbial life in the ocean, or she could go to uh, Montana and research microbial life at Yellowstone. And she decided to go to Montana instead of coming back here. And that could have been a more personal choice because she doesn't like me. Or, <laughs> or that could have been um, a, a, uh, an example of brain drain. Um, my sister is really smart, <laughs> so she has brains. But I think that Hawaii really needs to, well, obviously it's hard to live in Hawaii with the cost of everything. <laughs> Um, and we need to, uh, I don't know, figure out, figure out a way to solve the housing crisis. <laughs> I'm not sure. Well, I know that a, a big part of that w w will be having people here doing science at, at a world-class level so that that science can cross that very uh, hard-to-define line into technology and, and applications yeah. and so forth. And the more we have that happen, the more we're going to build a robust e economy. So you might be part of that someday. Uh, I, I just wanted to ask you to share a little bit in the short time we have remaining that, that might inspire other young men and women like yourself to seize a discipline, whether it be science or whether it be some other field, and, and to take it to the next level for them right now. How can, how can you do that? How, how, how does that happen I think for somebody you need to balance just, school and life and everything? I think you just need to try things until you find something that you love. Because if you do something that you don't love uh, for your whole life, you're not going to be happy. And you also won't be very good at that thing. And I think the people that are best at their respective fields love what they do. And that's how they got so good. So I encourage young people. I'm a young person, but I encourage other young people um, to just try everything they can. If an opportunity comes up, like speaking on a talk show, just do that because it's an opportunity and you don't want to waste it. Well, very good. Well, you've seized this opportunity and done Thank well. You. That's a <laughs> fitting note to end on. Thank you, Chris, very much for yep. being on the show today. Thanks for having me. My guest, guest today, Christopher Lindsay, scientist. Watch for his name in the future. Who knows? He may be a future Carl Sagan or he may end up pursuing his political career, given his political talents. But uh, I, I think uh, today was an inspiring time as we looked at not only the, the accomplishments of this young man, but the potential that Hawaii has uh, as we invest in our keiki and as we consider that they can be actively involved in real science and other disciplines at an early age. That's powerful, and that's going to change the future of Hawaii. I'm Keili'i Akina. You're watching Ehana Kako on the Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Until next week, aloha.